folks, here we are. The sun about to set, the curtain about to come down on Project Inspire 2024. So in all my years of speaking and gallivanting around the world, <coughs> if I have to think of one question that repeats itself in different iterations, it goes something like this. Rabbi, I, I, I didn't order this child. Rabbi, I, you don't understand. This wasn't supposed to happen in my life. I had this whole thing planned out. We sat down. I worked with my CPA. This, this business wasn't supposed to go insolvent. It's one form or other of that concept. <clears throat> very, very common. And so hopefully what I'm going to do today before the standing ovation is dispel one of the most oft cited notions from pop culture and hopefully explain to you guys that that's not a Torah concept. So the notion that we're going to explain, unfortunately, is it's really perpetuated through mainstream media and that's the notion called the pleasure principle. That ultimately we're in this world for pleasure and that this world's supposed to be like Disneyland, right? And so when the curveball happens, and one of the kids, Rahman son, starts going off the derech, and when you realize that there's a certain thing about your spouse that's getting out of your skin, or when something happens in the business, and there's pain, and there's challenges, there's something, there's a knee-jerk reflex reaction to look heaven-bound and say, why me? This wasn't supposed to happen. This wasn't in the script. It's a very deep-seated, hard-wired way that the Western world sees the way you were supposed to see the world. I've spoken pretty much all over the world. You'll find that this is not something <coughs> that is troubling to a lot of people where the main religion is Buddha. Any Buddhists in the, in the audience? <laughs> so they hold their whole concept. By the way, joke, all jokes aside, <coughs> There are approximately 250,000 Jews in America, Jewish Buddhists. So I have a very dear friend who I'm sure most of you know, a fellow South African, Akira Tatz. So he wrote a book called A Letter to a Buddhist Jew. And he was just telling me that he did some research before, 250,000 Jews who somehow subscribe to Buddhism. The interesting thing about Buddhism, I don't know how you can possibly be happy in that religion. Their whole notion, right, is that a lot of this journey is suffering and we're here to somehow in their Loshan, Masak and your, your Neshama, they don't have this problem about this pleasure principle. That life is supposed to be Disneyland and when there's bumps in the road, we look heaven bound. So what's the problem with this Western ethos, this pop culture notion that it's supposed to be Firstly, life's supposed to pretty much go according to script. It's supposed to be all good times. Here's the problem, my friends is that the world is not going to devote itself to making you happy. I cannot, if, I, if I got $1,000 for every person who's come to the podium after any of these, something I said, man, that's storming out already. $1,000 for anyone who comes to the podium and says, Rabbi, <coughs> I'm, I'm not happy. And then blah, blah, blah. So. The world's not going to devote itself to making you happy and you're not in this world to basically eat cotton candy and have pleasure in the sense of the Western ethos. If you do think that, the chances are that there's going to be an inevitable bump in the road and you are going to have that knee-jerk reaction to look heaven bound. And I hope and pray for every single person, and I bench every single person in this room, that you will not go 40 days without some, some pain in your life. As we said in my previous class, that is not a good sign. Very clearly, the Gemara says you go 40 days without some form of pain. It's a simon that Kaviyochel HaKadosh Baruch Hu has been a symptom, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, I'm indifferent to you. One of the ways that we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us and is involved in our lives is that in the notion of what road we're supposed to take, He will do certain things so we recalculate. Right? We, the final destination we know is the Hebrew Kedisha. We sometimes veer, and a Kaddish Baruch who, using certain circumstances and events in our life, will make sure we get back on track. That's painful to us. We think, as the Western world has sold, has sold us, that pain is bad. Tr 
tremendous, tremendous, tremendous disservice. I work with a lot of Gen, Gen Z. I speak a ton on campus. That's one of the, I see it, that's one of the, the most painful things that people think that pain is bad. From a Torah perspective, pain is not bad. Pain is, going to be, is the price that you pay for greatness. What's the pedagogical example that the, that the Gomorrah uses? The birth of a child. Okay? Nine months of gestation, the pain of the birth canal, and afterwards, what do you have to, you should, the most beautiful thing in the world is a beautiful, beautiful child. There's nothing that you will achieve that's worth it in this journey called life that you will achieve without pain. Which is one of the reasons, by, by the way, on Friday night, if you ever notice that people who understand halacha will never cut the challah and hand you a piece of challah. They'll put it on the table. From a, from a metaphysical point of view, because no one wants a handout. Bread of shame. One of the most painful things that you can possibly do to a person is take away their dignity. So we never hand something to somebody. That's the notion of bed of shame. There has to be the notion of having earned something. If, if a lady came into this, this room right now and just walked across this, this, this uh, podium and sat there, is that, is that a great achievement? We wouldn't say, what if I tell you that she had polio and every step is excruciatingly painful? That's an achievement. Anything that's worth achieving in this world <clears throat> that you'll hold onto that has longevity is going to be painful. So we start off saying that one of the things that I hear very often in all my travels <coughs> is, Rabbi, this was not supposed to happen. This wasn't in the script. Everything was going so well. How can I stand here in front of Tori anytime, live streaming to 1.2 billion people, and bench people that you should go 40 days and you should feel some pain? That's proof positive that a Kaddish Baruch is in your life. It's very interesting. One year, I forgot, it was a KMR or Gateway, and I made a comment like this. A lady came up to the podium afterwards and said, I forgot the name if there's a doctor in the room. She's got, this, this person physically does not feel pain. The only reason, if she hand, puts her hand over the stove, the only reason she knows her hand's burning is she smells fle flesh. That's a horrific thing. <clears throat> so pain is God's way of saying, let's recalculate. So the, one, the first reason that people have this notion this wasn't supposed to happen is their preconceived idea is that life is Disneyland, the, pre the, the pleasure principle, and therefore any bump in the, ro the road wasn't supposed to happen. We started seeing a little bit of movement in the secular world in 1978. In 1978, one of the most, certainly one of the most famous, best-selling self-help book was penned by Scott Peck called The Road Less Traveled. Why was it such a classic? Why was it such a paradigm shift? Because Scott Peck used the three magic words as his opening gambit, and he got a lot of flack for this. Life is tough. He was the first person to say, it's not Disneyland, Rob Waisai. Life's tough. Thank you. Vodka said. <laughs> Life is very tough. <clears throat> now, the difference between Scott Peck and the Hamoyan Am and most people is he, that's where he stopped. He said, Life's tough, show him, have a good life. I'm going to hopefully tell you before the standing ovation that the, for sure there's going, to be, there's, there's going to be bumps in the road, but I'm going to hopefully explain the rhyme and the reason for the bumps in the road. So that happened in 1978. <clears throat> Let me try and focus on what is the Torah perspective of this notion that we get into this world. What's, if, if, if it's not pleasure, if it's not Disneyland, if we're not here to figure out how we're going to buy a house in David's Village and whether we're going to get into KMR and whether we're going to blue check, if that's not what life's about, then what's life about? The purpose of life, and you heard it here, live first at Project Inspire, is to really get close to Akharish Baruch That, at the end of the day, is why we're here. What's more important than speaking to Akharish Baruch Hu? Oh. On the right track. Given, uh, uh, Avram Avinu was speaking to the Rabbani Shalom himself, right? The Malachim came into the oil, into the tent. He put the Abish on hold and said, one second, I'll be right there. And he went to be Mishtatev in the mitzvah of Hachnas Hazorim. Why? Because more important than speaking to God is being like God. To be benevolent, to be a giver, to be selfless. <clears throat> so the purpose of life is to get as close as you possibly can to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The idea of reaching your potential is the, is the Torah concept of Gehenna, of hell. This is not a joke. This is very serious because some people keep a joke about this thing. There's a notion when you come to the next world, if you, if you read... 
Nefesh Chaim, the Gesher Chaim, all Tzvarim that talk about the journey of the soul to the next world. You're going to get into a proverbial movie house. You're going to see in that movie house people that were Nifta before and they're already in the Yenna Welt. And you're sitting there with your buttered popcorn and your Diet Coke and you're going to see a panoramic, panoramic view of your entire life. There is no doubt that everyone in this room is going to be chalishing at certain scenes. You don't want people to know, because I know what you've done. You don't want people to know some of the things that you've done in your life. How do you make sure that when you're there and you're seeing that movie, that you don't jump under the proverbial chair and, and you, you have no defenses in this, you and the Rabbi Shalom? How do you make sure that you don't see those scenes where we all have done things as fallible human beings that we regret, that we have tremendous harata? How do you see the cut version and not the, how do you see the cut version not the uncut version? It's the biggest gift that the Abish has given us and it was here before the world create, was created. Tshuva, very good. <coughs> Tshuva completely takes and splices that scene out. Remember the time that you threw the kettle at your wife? Gone. <laughs> <coughs> I said I'm sorry, it didn't help. I've got a drone outside your house, buddy. <coughs> So the difference between singing the cut or uncut version is simply a thing called tshuva. If it's genuine and HaKadosh Baruch Hu you really have charata, the Abishal will make sure that you have a, a similar matzav and you'll be omed, you'll be able to withstand and surmount that, it's gone. So that's one part of what's going to happen in Yenavelt. There's another part of what's going to happen in Yenavelt is <clears throat> you're going to see the person that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted you to be and you should have been. And the Gemara says very, very, very clear, and it's very hard to understand this because you don't have a goof in the next world. There is a scream that the Gemara says is something <coughs> that, that is, we, we bellow once in our journey, and that's when, at this moment, and you're going to scream because you see what you could have been, and you know who you are, and that disparity is Gehenna. Because for eternity, you know that you were supposed to be, you're supposed to pay for the Lakers, and here you are paying for Yeshiva Gadola. <laughs> for eternity. The idea of getting close to the branch means actualizing your potential. Who was a person who actualized their potential? Who was a person that reached the zenith of their potential? He was the first Jew. The, f the first Jew is? Avram. How many tests did Avram have? On, after the binding of Isaac, the 10th test, a bus call came out and said what? Avraham, Avraham. Why the Medrash says why twice? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu was saying to him, the Avram potential down here had reached his potential. It was in parody. You, my friend, have actualized your potential. But it's the subtext that I want to focus on. How did he get there? Nisyonis. Ten tests. I'm writing a book now <coughs> through Mosaic Publication, which is the concept of, Nesiva Shalom says, in all of our lives, just like Avram Avinu had 10 tests, because we are, we inherited the spiritual genes of Avram Avinu, we are the progeny of Avram Avinu, every single person in this room has 10 main tests in your life. The Nesiva Shalom is very, very interesting. If you're very, very much in touch with your feelings, you can figure out what test you're on. Every person is going to go through 10 main tests that touch on Imuna, or touch on the concept of wanting to look heaven bound and why me? Every person in this room. The book is about the 10 contemporary tests that we all go through as a, someone who's been in the speaking circuit for a long time. But the idea is that the purpose of life is to get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We don't like the mechanism Hashem has used so that we shed a skin and get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu because it's painful. There is no way that you can achieve your mission, your tough kid in this world without pain, without what we call suffering, without these curveballs in your life. So now that you've heard it here, there's one question that I get 5,000, any, any speaker gets this question that I want you to get out of your head, is why? What you want, what we're, gonna, what we're gonna focus on once we hopefully get grasp this concept is not Lama, but another word of it with the same etymology, which, which means Lamar. Instead of why, Lamar means to what end. Now that this has happened to me, now that I can understand that this is coming from an altruistic, benevolent, all-loving God that loves me more than I love my own children, and there's no mikra, and there's no serendipity, and there's no coincidence, now what do I do with this? So that's a very different question. Lama is a question that at best will cause you to perseverate and freeze. There are, you'll never ever, if any rabbi tells you why something is happening to you and he's not a, we don't have Naveem today, there are certain people that have a certain mystical insight, but they are quack. 
There's, if a rabbi, when I, one thing that Rabbi Wanda taught us, Rabbi Yaakov Wanda, is that if there's anyone in the audience who asks you about the Holocaust and you start answering, it's an arrogant chutzpah. You never answer that question. I'll tell you a true story. I think I can say this before here. <coughs> Marty Berger, we were once in the rover, and I think this is how the whole thing started. And there was a person that asked a question about uh, the Holocaust, and he started answering certain things. And he noticed out of the corner of his eye that the person with their hand up had a number. What are you going to say? So <coughs> if I'm telling you right now that life is not the pleasure principle, that the reason why we're in this world is to get close to Hashem, and the mechanism that HaKadosh Baruch Hu set in the world is nisyonis and, and pain, then we know that pain is not bad. What's a, what's a general Yiddish salutation that you say when you see each other? When you, say, when you see each other in the lobby, what, what do people usually say in Yiddish? Vos machteid. What's the title of vos machteid? What are you making of yourself, right? So the idea is you, you, you're here to grow. The biggest insult that you can possibly say to a person is, Rabbi Gordon, you're unbelievable. I heard you last year. You say same old, same old. That's the biggest insult that you can say to a person. Same old just means you're one year closer to the heavenly condition and you haven't changed. We're here to grow. We're here to work through the certain things. And I can also tell you something else. In the time of the Vilna Go, in the time of the Gro, which is a few hundred years ago, he said you can safely assume that every single person sitting in this room is a Gilgal. You have to be the Gro to say that, <coughs> which means there's certain things that are happening in your life that, that are inexplicable. That you were here on a different cycle, right? You were probably some pregnant South African woman. In a pre I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> exactly. So I, those kind of questions, that's when rabbis start answering those questions, it's very myopic. Okay. So first thing is that we have to get close to Kaddish Baruch Hu. The mechanism to get close to Kaddish Baruch Hu is tough times. Next. <clears throat> You've got to understand that pain and what we call misiones, suffering, setbacks, was built into creation. How do we know that? If you look at the text of Bereshis, right, and I'll say it in, just for the camera in English. Um, in the beginning, HaKadosh Baruch Hu created heaven and earth. The earth was without form and empty with darkness. The word for darkness, tchum, is the is Zeloshin. If you understand what the Mephorashim, it's a deep sense of suffering. It's a sense that no one gets to the end of this journey called life without pain, without suffering. But if you go weiter, again, I'll just say it in English, it says, and the, and the spirit of Elohim shall hover. Meaning that there's a rhyme and a reason why this is happening. I'm going to give you good news. Anyone who's going through pain or suffering at the moment. Firstly, let me just back up a second before I answer that question. What, how did we get the name Yisrael, our nation? How did that happen? When did it happen? When did we get the name of Yisrael as we are the people of Israel? Asa. Very good. So there's an altercation between Yaakov and Asaph. <coughs> okay, what was the Loshan that was used? Soriso means what? Struggle. That's how you get the word Yisrael. We here in this world, it's all about struggling. You have absolutely no control over what happens to you in this journey called life, but you have control over the way you react to what happens to you. HaKadosh Baruch is not judging you by the fact that you've got one kid that is driving you absolutely nuts and sits at the Shabbos table picking their nose and it's embarrassing. You have absolutely no control that after 10 years of marriage, suddenly you, your wife became a Macha Shefer. You have absolutely, but you have complete control the way you react to it. That's, the, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's the way you react and it's struggle. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't care <coughs> about the victory part that's up to him. It's during that struggle what happens. Anyone know in this room how a pearl is made? A pearl. Yeah. Beautiful. It's the first time that I've got an answer in the front row, in the splash zone. What's your name? Heshel Mendoza. Tell me how a pearl is made. What, what, firstly, what animal makes a pearl? Uh, what oyster. Okay. What, how, how does an oyster make a pearl? Piece of sand enters into the shell, irritates the uh, oyster. This is unbelievable. In 30 years of public speaking, um, you, okay, we, get, this is, we should be playing Vegas. Forget the blue boys, the Jew boys. This is fantastic. So 100%, that's exactly right. So what happens is you've got an oyster, which has got, by the way, a hard shell. So a Kaddish Baruch made it so that it gets a piece of grit caught in between the hard shell and its flesh. What happens? It's painful. 
So what did HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it? It, so what it, it, it exudes a certain fluid, that fluid metastasizes over that grit, and that becomes a pearl. What happens at the time of that pain if the oyster takes out a joint and starts smoking a joint? <laughs> what happens if the oyster starts taking a six pack, takes an a, a, a 18 year old scotch, complete and it's gone. That's the reason why, Rabbi Isai, when people try and neutralize pain, and I see it speaking to campuses all the time, through, <coughs> through things like substance abuse, drinking, pornography, these are all ways of trying to escape. You're going to miss the, you're going to miss the opportunity to grow. The reason, one of the things that we are put in this world to do is to take your stumbling blocks and to turn them into stepping stones. If you make yourself completely neutral, if you're taking Valium, if you're running away, you go, you're not only not gonna grow, you're going to say basically, Akadosh Baruch this is too much. It's a great pedagogical example of how a pearl is made. A pearl is something that's precious, it's beautiful, it comes out of pain. <coughs> so let me go back to my point. If anyone's going through tough times, you should know, but there are Klal, that the storm will subside and there will be a rainbow at the end of the storm. How do we know this? How do you start counting a day in the Jewish calendar? It's a night. Very good. I'll give you the macro and how this is no to us as individuals. There's always the Yerida before the Aliyah. There's always the proverbial pain <coughs> before you have the Yeshua. Yishmael was born before? Yes. Asaph was born before? Yaakov. We first had slavery, and then we had the emancipation. You will always have the proverbial pain, and then the Yeshua. The goal here is to use the, that pain in a pedagogical way. Instead of looking heavenbound and saying, why me? Is to say, I know you love me. I'm not sure if I understand this, but I'm not going to be bitter. I'm going to be better. They start with darkness. They start with darkness. So the idea of us, do we bench? Of Shabbos, what do we say in 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 uh, in Bikatamazon, in the beginning of Bikatamazon that you don't say during the week? Shira Malos. Did you say Hazorim Bedima Berina? What what is the touch? That if you plant it with tears, you'll reap with joy. That's why I can say with confidence when I, ever I speak to people about Taurus, Hakadosh Baruch Hu put in the world the idea there's going to be an end to this and the cycle's going to turn. Everything's in cycles, and I'm hoping that your life is like this. Like an EKG, because if it's like this, have a condition, my friend. The only people that have a life like this are in the cemetery, right? There is nobody, I've been doing this for a long time. There is nobody, nobody ever who's answered this question, and I've done this all over the world. Is there anyone in this room right now whose life is going perfectly according to pain, who doesn't have a peckle or no pain? I want you to stand up right now. You're either lying or it's a terrible sign. It's a terrible sign. There are Yechidim in Shas, which we're, we're, they had so-called a cakewalk. It wasn't a good sign. The okay. Other one, the, the other one's standing, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> a Hevraman. A Hevraman. There's one, there's one in every shear. <clears throat> okay, Rabbi Sai. So we start off by saying, that the, I think the topic, one second, I'll take questions then. The topic is, why me? What, what, what's the exact topic of the, is, is... <laughs> This is not the life that I'm supposed to have. We said, why do we say that? Because the Western ethos, pop culture, has inculcated into us the notion of uh, the pleasure principle that life is Disneyland, and therefore, when the curveballs inevitably do happen, we have a proclivity to look heaven bound and saying, Oh, Brahmanis, it wasn't supposed to be like that. We dispelled that and said, That's not why we're in this world. We're in this world to get close to Akadish Baruch. Akadish Baruch, the pedagogical methodology Hashem uses for us to get close to Him is what we consider pain. Otherwise, we would sit and watch reruns of Jerry Seinfeld on the couch, eating chocolate pretzels, and you will not grow, and you will basically be a walking cadaver. And therefore, he creates, and for every single person in this room, I said that the Nesiva Shalom says that you're all going to have 10 tests. Every single one of you are going to have 10 tests. And those 10 tests are customized, tailor-made. You will never handle the fact, the test of the woman in the back who's got a shaitel that gives her a headache, you're not going to have that test. <laughs> you're not going to have that test with the, with, the, with the parents that I spoke to. It's customized, okay? So now let's talk about how do we, how do we break this habit? How do we break this notion of <clears throat> this wasn't so supposed to be like this, Rabbi? How do we break this preconceived idea? Okay, number one, you've got to let go of expectations. So one of the hardest things is to let go of expectations. I'll give you some sources in the Torah. <clears throat> 
Cain and Hevel. What happened with Cain? The first murder in the whole, in the advent of the creation of the world. So, so Cain expected HaKadosh Baruch to give him the same good favor as his brother. Didn't end out too well, right? What happened with the, with the biggest Avera that we've done as a people and we're still paying the price? The Chet Eagle. Was there an expectation of Kali Yisrael? They expected him to, Moshe Rabbeinu to come back. Also, when the, when the credits roll, not a happy ending. The idea of having an expectation, how do we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to jettison this expectation so we don't have, is because of the first test of Avram Avinu. We said the last test was the Kedah. The first test of Avram Avinu was? Lechacha. Did he know where he was going? How can you have expectations if you don't know where you're going? Okay, I, I want to ask you the following. <coughs> if I told you, you're going to get a Project Inspire 2024, you're going to pay 7,800 bucks for every two minutes, <laughs> it's, it's going to be, ter- the, the air conditioning doesn't work, we're, we're, the, the food is at best a C minus, and you arrive here and it's gavaldic. How would you feel? Surprised. But you'll be, will you feel... <laughs> What happens when they say to the Pesach program, this is Gun Aiden, you have no idea, you're walking there, there's going to be balloons, and you go in there, and it's mama, she's walk into a, a, a doghouse. You're going to complain, the manager, so expectations set you up for, for, for what we would call your sense of being too freedom or not. If you can jettison expectations <coughs> like Lech Lecha, which is the example the Torah uses of, then we're going to definitely live a, a happier life. What's, what's the problem with expectations? When you have expectations, what's the, sub, what's the subtext? What are you really saying or thinking to yourself when you expect something? One, okay. Number one, that I'm in control. Number two, I deserve this. It's a pretty arrogant assumption, right? Do you know what's good for, us, for, for you? <laughs> we think we do. When you take your three-year-old little kid, Moishi, <coughs> to get inoculated for chicken pox, right? <coughs> you know that that's good for this kid because if he doesn't get inoculated, and it's a little three-year-old kid, you're going to the doctor and you push this little kid towards someone with a big white coat with a needle this big, what do you think the kid feels? You betrayal, mommy, what are you doing? And what's the second that happens after he gets zetzed in the arm? He turns around and he hugs who? Because he knows that's where the love's from, right? But at the time, when he's getting pushed, he has no idea what's happening. <clears throat> it's very arrogant to know that we know God's plan. So the idea of, of jettisoning expectations <clears throat> is that you're going to set yourself up for disappointment. And <clears throat> we know from Lech Lecha, if you can, quote unquote, <clears throat> go with go with the flow and don't have certain expectations, you're going to live a happy life. Give me, let me just finish. Sorry? How do you get up in the morning without I'm going to come to how you get up in the morning in a second with your shaitel on. Hold on one second. <laughs> Number two. <laughs> you've got to stop playing God. Here's the scene, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> what if I tell you, you look through a keyhole and there's a person with a huge dagger with a mask over his face and he's about to bear down on someone lying. What would you scream? What do you think? It's bloody murder. And if I tell you that, we open the door, and behind that door is a world-famous surgeon. And he's about to cut out a malignant tumor, and he's about to save someone's life. So we see the world through that keyhole. HaKadosh Baruch Hu has the whole picture. He's outside time, and he knows. Every single person that walked into this unbelievable lecture today, you walking into your life, at best, in one or two frames of a huge movie. And you see... The black horse and the black hat and the white, per- the white horse and the white hat seems to be shot and wounded. What's going on here? The, 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 the evil is... Pr- and you see one little slice of life and we try and understand. We have no clue what happened before and how the movie is going to end. And we're judging on that. So we come into life, we come into the movie for one or two slices <coughs> and we're trying to understand the whole movie. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is outside time. He knows exactly what's going to happen to you in three years' time. He knows what's going to happen to your life. And more than that, He loves you and He's going to direct you as best you have to. He'll never take your Bechir away, but He will direct you so that you will have the closest way to reach your potential and to have the ultimate happiness. Now, what's the difference between fun and happiness? Big mistake that the Western world makes. What's it? And they've conflated fun and happiness. We said that I think in one of the lectures I spoke before. If I go to Six Flags and we do uh, wheelies and we have popcorn and we come off the, the roller coaster and we sit down and vomit, fun or happiness? <laughs> That's fun, right? Why is it a year ago when I walked my beautiful daughter down the aisle within one step, a tear welled up, halfway down the, the thing I was bawling my eyes out, was those tears of fun or happiness? What's the difference? 
paying the bill. It's, it's, it's great. I use your credit card. What's the, what's the difference between the two? Why is it not tears of fun? I'll give you a clue. One touches the neshama and the other doesn't. Can you explain to me why, when you, when you stand at this wall here, not much happens, but can you explain to me how, why many, many Jews over the years go to the, the, the western wall, the, the Kaisal, and they start crying? Manaf Kamina, well, what happened here? That's the, that's the neshama. That's the neshama. The difference between fun and happiness, <coughs> and there's a huge mistake. Because there's a declaration of independence in this country that says that life, liberty, and the... And you think that happiness is exogenous, it's outside. Happiness is not in that state, or in that state, it's in the state of mind. What's the closest word that we have to happiness in Lashon HaKodesh? Simcha. Simcha. If you, Rav Hirsch uses phonetically, Simcha is, similarly to, is a similar concept phonetically to Tzomach, which means to grow. There's a big mistake the Western world makes and thinks that happiness is an end in and of itself. Happiness is a byproduct of living a meaningful life. That's the reason why Rabbi Isai says, Ivdu es Hashem. But everyone focuses on the Simcha. It's Ivdu, it's work. It's work. People, we, my, my, my day job is managing and, uh, very famous people in the athletic world. People have got ridiculous amounts of money. The 